Remember when Monday mornings were like this? They're a bit different now. While those of us lucky to be working are now doing so from a spare bedroom or a kitchen table, the coronavirus has forced a sudden and mostly successful pivot to working away from the office. While the circumstances are unwelcome, there are some benefits to this style of working. You have a more content workforce, a more motivated workforce, and, and also a more productive and efficient workforce as well. So when the coronavirus is behind us, will our workday ever be the same again? We spend a lot of our time travelling to work, and for most, the commute is getting longer all over the world. Globally, two-fifths of professionals consider the commute to be the worst part of their day. Commuting has been found to be a major cause for stress that impacts on our physiological health and as well well-being. The total working day gets longer, you get less time at home, you do less exercises, when you have long commutes, you also cook less healthy food. I followed Swedish couples over a 10-year period, and uh, we found that commuting long distances to work over one hour increases the risk of separation. Uh, overall, we find that it's a 40% increase of risk of separating. Before the pandemic, approximately 25 million US workers spent more than 90 minutes getting to and from their jobs every day. In South Korea, one in four workers has a journey that long. One of those people is Park Jong Han, a manager at a major telecoms company. Basically, I throw away three hours of my daytime just to get to work and to come back home. Since February, SK Telecom has instructed its employees, including Yong Han, to work from home, or if suitable, to work from smaller local offices in the surrounding neighborhoods of Seoul. One of the mobile offices. If I walk, it takes about 15 minutes. I truly appreciate the time. Uh, and, and it actually uh, comes back to motivation to, to work harder. It's not just time. It's a very quality time that I spend. Instead of, you know, getting stuck in a, in a bus, you know, Get stuck in a traffic somewhere, it's, it, it cannot compare. The amount of time that I spent with my family really increased. You know, you know during lunch time, I can have lunch time with my son. Have you just shortened your hours and you're able to go and, like you said, exercise more, or or do you find yourself working more as a result? Because it's been too long, I, I totally forgot about it. But in the very beginning, uh, when when this program started, um, I was exhausted actually uh, during the first few days because there is no place for, for rest, right? Because I, I need to work anywhere, <laughs> wherever I go. Um, my mind was always on work. And when I talked to um, the teammates, they actually felt the same in the beginning. But after a few weeks, um, I, I think everyone found their own way to work. And now I know how to adjust you know, myself into you know, work mode versus, you know, rest mode and so on. So losing that journey into work could be good for us. But research claims our commute can also provide us with a means to separate our personal and professional lives. And in a world of 10 second bed to laptop commutes, that's a chance for some me time. But while journey times were already generally on the up, more of us we're actually starting to commute less, thanks to a relatively new trend, flexible working. Increasingly, we have seen people remote working from lots of different locations. There has been a, a reluctance to encourage flexible working, perhaps because managers see it as a loss of control. It can be quite difficult to manage people who you don't necessarily see on a day-to-day -day basis. There might be concerns around efficiency or productivity. And is that a bit of a myth or is uh, any of that borne out in fact? 
What we found is that productivity um, can actually improve as a result of flexible working and there isn't necessarily any impact upon um, the business if it's managed effectively. There's quite a lot of benefits. There is an opportunity for workers to have more autonomy over their scheduling, over when they work and where they work. And when people have that degree of autonomy, it does lead to a workforce that is um, happier. You may have flexibility over the time that you have to go into work or the time that you can come home so that you're able to avoid rush hour traffic. Um, and if you're working from home, um, a few days a week or completely at home, then obviously you can avoid the commuting altogether. And there's also benefits for employers. A study by Harvard and New York University found that for those working from home, the workday is 48 minutes longer, probably replacing that time you spent commuting. There's significant benefits for organisations that are able to manage this, these kind of processes effectively. So what actions can organisations implement to harness the power of flexible working? They need to have very clear processes and procedures around operating flexible work so that everybody has the same expectations. One department allows um, the majority of their employees to work flexibly in another department, which is led by another line manager who has a different view then you might find that flexible working isn't as supported uh, as much. You need to treat people um, consistently and in a fair way, but you also need to recognise that there can be um, individual differences in how people um, adapt to flexible working. It will some, suit some people, but not others. Um, so you do need to have a degree of flexibility yourself as a manager um, in how you manage teams and how you manage people. And this flexibility can lead to productivity. A two-year Stanford study of a thousand employees at one company found that working from a home office resulted in a 13% increase in productivity, and 50% of them were less likely to quit. Despite this, half of them still wanted to go back to the office nine months later, even though their average commute was 40 minutes each way. Another survey, conducted by Bain and Company on its own employees, found that productivity increased for some thanks to no commute and an ability to focus better at home, but also decreased for others due to a lack of work mindset and a dedicated workspace. So perhaps we'll start to see a more hybrid style become the norm, where for some days we work from home for specific solo tasks, and others we travel to the office to meet and collaborate with the team. The changing nature of our working lives has already led to many white-collar workers leaving the city or moving further out to find more space, some greenery, or to escape the urban beeps and bustle. One person who misses the commute is Alice Shea, an urban planner and designer. I miss riding the subway. Uh, riding the subway is one of those incredible experiences in New York City. It's got its highs and it's got its lows. But honestly, the subway system in New York City is one of the greatest levers for equity that we have it is one price to get all the way across the city. Many of us are now working from home, you know, or at least for a couple of days of the week. Will where we live drastically change, do you think? We're in a moment where commutes can be zero. So what does that mean for how we are distributed across our settlements and urban uh, agglomerations? I think it provides a lot of flexibility for certain workers. It's true. But there's other ties that keep people to place, right? It's not just about commute. So that's one factor amongst many. Access to services, access to family, um, access to the, you know, the culture that keeps a city alive or your lifestyle interesting. So the, the city as we know it isn't exactly going anywhere, but uh, it, it might change in the way that we use it and the, the way it works. Our, uh, street infrastructure and streetscapes can be reconfigured in a time of social distancing when we're understanding that private cars may not be as essential as we thought they were. We posited that if you took the streetscape in Manhattan, which is equivalent to four times the size of Central Park, reconfigured it in a way that actually looked at streetscapes as being about space for mobility and distribution at a bigger scale, so how do we actually decrease the number of private cars and what are the opportunities that come with that? So um, increased space for pedestrians and walking, more effective 
uh, distribution systems. Buses could run at least twice as fast, getting people around the city in an equitable way. Uh, the transformation of the way that we use our streetscapes could also um, enable better delivery of urban systems. Is there an opportunity to, to build uh, more equality in cities? You know, key workers, for instance, who, who aren't doing jobs on a laptop right now, they have to be in those areas, don't they? You know, no matter what. I mean, you bring up a great point. Service workers, essential workers, they are geographically bound. Mobile healthcare could be distributed more widely, more equitably, particularly if um, there's government um, and public drivers behind the way that that is distributed. Um, we're also seeing massive changes in the way that retail is happening, right? Um, many, many shops are closed. When we have times when cities are more porous, when there's flux, um, when, you know, real estate sector isn't so saturated, that porousness allows for an opportunity for micro entrepreneurship and also um, new innovations at a kind of small scale. Um, you know, small businesses that are starting up, food trucks that are going to be distributing food across the city, um, different types of services that operate in different types of places. Our changing relationship with work could affect where we live too. It could accelerate a move to what's known in urban planning theory as the polycentric city. Polycentric city would be a place where you can work, you can live, you can recreate, you can have your social life, your family, um, in a more local and distributed way. In cities like Paris, it's known as the 15-minute city, where daily necessities are within a 15-minute reach on foot or by bike. You reduce transit times, you reduce GHG emissions, and also you provide uh, more equitable, more sustainable access to services by this more distributed city model. But that's not to say that you need to live in the suburbs, right? So what's to say the office can't come closer to us? I think going forward, companies will need to support workers in that externality. Um, and it could take many forms. Does everyone want to work from home? No. Some people like going to a place, commuting. How are companies that usually would say, come to your our main office? Oh, now actually we have a set of sponsored co-working spaces across the city that are closer to where you live and can decrease your commute. And um, maybe you go to those spaces three days a week and you come into the office too. I think we're going to see a whole range of new types of work as people have gained confidence um, in the efficiency of work from home during this time. Since the virus outbreak, serviced office brand Regis has already seen a surge of more than 40% in activity in New York City commuter hub Southern Connecticut. In the UK, house builders are seeing developments outside of London driven by a change in home office working. While experiences and jobs vary all over the world, many workers have come to expect change. More than 90% of people in a recent survey said they wouldn't return to the office full-time after COVID. There's reasons for employers to embrace the change too. Some already are. Twitter and Facebook have said the switch could become permanent for large parts of their workforce. The COVID-19 pandemic has sent shockwaves through the world of work. Having an on-off relationship with the office could make us happier and more productive while also helping the environment and making our cities more livable.